Uh, good afternoon and a warm welcome to this event on achieving climate outcomes for transformation. And thank you very much for your patience with the delayed start. Uh, my name is Kate Hughes and I'm a Principal Climate Change Specialist with ADB. This seminar brings together keynote speakers and panellists to discuss the critical actions that ADB, in partnership with other multilateral development banks and governments, can make to scale up and align climate finance with low carbon and climate resilient development outcomes. It also aims to explore how effective policies can improve the quantity and quality of finance and deliver climate outcomes. To start, I would like to invite ADB's Managing Director General, Mr. Wu Chong Um, to deliver the opening remarks. Wu Chong is responsible for ensuring bank-wide coherence on key initiatives and issues. He provides oversight to the Transformation Office, Office of the Safeguards, Department of Communications, and Knowledge Management. Over to you, Chong. Thank you very much, Kate. Good afternoon, Prime Minister Mark Brown, Minister Sri Mulyani, Minister Samir Sharifov, Professor Avinash Prasad, Mr. Joaquim Jugo, Vice President Fatima um, Yasmin, distinguished guests and friends and everyone who's joined here today. We are very, very pleased to open this very, very important topic um, in today's seminar. So this seminar, Achieving Climate Outcomes for Transformation, focuses on critical juncture where we now stand. The findings from the first global stock take and the report on the independent high-level expert group on climate finance underscore the urgent need for decisive action. The climate crisis is escalating right in front of us. These past nine years have been warmest on record, with 2024 on track to be even hotter. Just last week in Manila, our heat index was 48 degrees. It was truly unbearable. The past 10 months up to, and including March, set a new global temperature records. An increasing number of extreme weather events are already testing our resilience and adaptive capacities. From unprecedented droughts to devast devastating floods, climate change impacts are increasingly evident and they're happening much more frequently. Expanding the flows of available finance is key to generate the economic and social transformation required to achieve the climate outcomes we need. The challenges are stark. A recent report warns climate change will force an income reduction of 19% in the global economy until 2050. Even with drastic emission reduction, that's, that can start today. And many of the countries most vulnerable are to climate change are facing that stress. And the only way to surmount this unprecedented challenge in transforming economies to net zero pathways and protecting the lives and livelihoods of those on the climate front line is by combining our forces. That is why our decisions made today, the discussions today, explores how we can harness the collective will and resources of multilateral development banks governments, private sector, to catalyze transformative change. As institutions and organizations with the resources, expertise, connections to shape the future free from climate chaos, the onus is on us to drive transformational change. As Asia and the Pacific Climate Bank, guided by our Climate Change Action Plan, which we released last year, ADB is committed to help drive this change. This is reflected by our climate finance ambitions and our pledge to align all our operations with the climate, with Paris, align, Paris Agreement. ADB has transformed itself by ad adopting comprehensive roadmap to re of reforms, featuring a new operating model, NOM, for swifter and more proactive delivery of support to our developing member countries. Climate change is one of the two key shifts of the new operating model and ADB is committed to developing high quality and integrated climate solutions with our developing member countries to maximize the developing impact and address long-term challenges. But we alone cannot do this, do so much in, in, in this area. Ultimately, we need global alliance and financial reform 
shaped by bold ideas such as those set out under the Bridgetown Initiative. Sometimes governments, multilateral development banks, and private sector speak different languages. But increasingly, we are united in adopting a shared vision of what must be done. We must draw upon our diversity in thoughts and practical experiences to come up with new channels of climate finance and new ways of harnessing innovation. Today, you will hear from leaders and experts who are at the forefront of climate action. We are honored to have such highly esteemed keynote speakers who will update us on progress towards Paris Agreement goals and how multilateral development reforms under the Bridgetown Initiative can generate needed development financing and improve climate outcomes. The insights from our distinguished panelists will shed light on the necessary fiscal and financial strategies, innovative policies, and collaborative frameworks which multilateral development banks, governments, and the private sector can adopt to scale up our fight against climate change as we approach the forthcoming COP29 in Baku, November. Aligned with our vision to a bridge to the future at the annual meeting this year, let us continue to engage and cooperate to connect and build bridges between nations and sectors while forging a passage connecting the urgent need to, to take the action now to real and still possible sustainable future for our future generations. So we, we must all work together. We're not competing against each other. We are competing, competing against time. So let's get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wuchong. I'm now uh, pleased to introduce a video recording of our keynote speaker, Professor Jim Skier, Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Professor Skier was elected IPCC Chair for the seventh assessment cycle in 2023. He was co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 3 for the sixth assessment cycle. From 2009 to 2023, he was Professor of Sustainable Energy at Imperial College London. He was Research Director of the UK Energy Research Centre and Director of the Policy Studies Institute prior to that. We are pleased to play the video. Dear hosts, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for this opportunity to participate in this annual meeting and my apologies for not being there in person. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, approved the final report of its sixth cycle, the Synthesis Report, just over a year ago in Interlaken, Switzerland. As IPCC Chair for the seventh assessment cycle, I must stress that while the findings of that report stand the test of time, our climate has moved on. As confirmed by the World Meteorological Organization, 2023 was the hottest year on record, with particularly startling extremes in ocean temperatures. Extreme weather events and wildfires ceased to be part of future projections, and for too many of us became a present reality. Sea levels continue to rise relentlessly with consequences for small island states and low-lying coastal communities. All this is down to more than a century of human activities, including burning fossil fuels and unequal and unsustainable patterns of energy and land use. With every increment of warming, the world will become more and more dangerous. Beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, new risks will emerge, such as permafrost degradation, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, more extreme weather, and food insecurity. IPCC findings can be interpreted with reference to the three goals of the Paris Agreement, and this is what I will do now. First, on mitigation ambition and the long-term temperature goal. Five years ago, when the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees came out, I said that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is possible within the laws of chemistry and physics. I still stand by that, noting that this refers to a long-run average level of warming, not a single year like the one that we have just seen. But it's clear what, we'd, what would need to happen. 
Once emitted, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for centuries. It's the accumulation of emissions that matters. In the middle of the range of scenarios that we have assessed, greenhouse gas emissions peak before 2025, fall by 43% by 2030, 60% by 2035, 69% by 2040, and reach net zero mid-century. If we don't act now, we close the option of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, as we will have used up the available carbon budget by around the end of this decade. Second, on adaptation and resilience. Adaptation action has increased, but progress is uneven. Most observed adaptation is fragmented, small in scale, incremental, sector specific, and focused more on planning rather than implementation. Hard limits to adaptation, as well as soft limits caused by lack of resources and institutional capacity, are being reached in some sectors and regions. The increasing gaps between adaptation action taken and what's needed are largest among lower income populations. Now, third on finance and means of implementation, which is central to this meeting. The last IPCC report compared current tracked climate finance for mitigation against what would be needed by 2030 if we were on a pathway towards 1.5 or even 2 degrees warming. Finance flows would need to be scaled up by a factor of 3 to 6. The gap is actually least for electricity supply, a factor of 2 to 4, higher for transport and energy efficiency, and greatest for agriculture, forestry and land use measures, where a factor 10 to 30 scale-up is required. The UAE consensus reached at COP28 aims to triple renewable energy by 2030 at 20% compound growth, not out of line with recent progress. However, investment in renewables is dominated by three regions of the world, China, Europe and North America. Barriers to renewables take up in developing countries, notably in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, remain. These include the, uh, the adequacy of grid infrastructure and the high cost of capital tied to investment risk. This calls for coordinated action by the public and private sectors. Public investment in infrastructure via bilateral support and the multilateral development banks will be foundational in the developing world. But what about challenges outside electricity supply? We concluded that meeting the Paris Agreement long-term temperature goal implies rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban and infrastructure, including transport and buildings, and industrial systems. Electricity is not enough. Maintaining the momentum on emissions reduction means starting to take actions that touch people's lives more directly and involve individual investments that are much smaller in scale. And these investments must be made at the household and the farm level and may involve hundreds of millions, if not billions, of actors. Clear signalling by governments and the international community, including a stronger alignment of public sector finance and policy, and higher levels of public sector climate finance, reduces, un reduces uncertainty and transition risks for the private sector. But what about adaptation? Here, unfortunately, the investment gaps are even greater. Adaptation suffers from having no simple metric like carbon dioxide equivalent. Adaptation actions tend to have a public good character and are more embedded in general economic development. Unsurprisingly then, only 4-8% to 8 of tracked climate finance is allocated to adaptation, and more than 90% of adaptation finance comes from public sources. Increasing public and private finance flows by billions of dollars per year, including direct access to multilateral funds, strengthening public uh, project pipeline development, and shifting finance from readiness activities to project implementation can enhance adaptation. There are also challenges in directing private finance towards adaptation. At the moment, it can happen through three routes. 
Companies that identify physical climate risks to their supply chains, especially in the food sector, may choose to strengthen resilience among their suppliers. Projects that yield both mitigation and adaptation outcomes, generally related to agriculture and land use, can foster adaptation as a co-benefit of mitigation financing. And, potentially, insurance companies may have incentives to promote adaptation in order to manage their exposure to physical climate risks. Ladies and gentlemen, to round off, this is a challenging agenda. But there is enough money in the world to address the triple planetary crises of climate change, biodiversity and chemicals and pollution. The challenge is to put in place the mechanisms by which financial resources can be directed to where they are needed. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to addressing these challenges throughout IPCC's seventh assessment cycle. Um, these words from Professor Skier have really reinforced the urgency and scale of the challenge that we're facing and set the scene for today's discussion. To follow from this, we're delighted to have an in-person keynote and I would like to introduce Avinash Persaud, Special Advisor on Climate Change to the President at the Inter-American Development Bank. Avinash has over 30 years of experience in finance, public policy and academia and he was Special Climate Envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados and an architect of the Bridgetown Initiative. Avanesh, we'd like to welcome you to the stage. Protocol having been established, good afternoon everyone. I bring to you special greetings from President Ilan Gofain of the Inter-American Development Bank, fraternal greetings uh, your sister multilateral development bank. And I salute the strong partnership between President Asakawa and President Gofain, a partnership which has partly uh, contributed to the multilateral development banks working as a system in a way we have never worked before together. But much has to be done. We are a long, long, long way from where we need to be on climate finance. We are, however, have moved somewhere, some way along from where we were just a couple years ago. The multilateral development bank headroom for lending has probably increased by $400 billion over the past couple years in response to the CAF reforms, led largely by the Asian Development Bank and other development banks like the IDB and the World Bank and the African Development Banks. We now have a loss and damage fund for the first time after 30 years of negotiation. We have the spread of climate resilient disaster clauses, natural disaster clauses. These are more significant than they may appear. If every country had a pandemic clause, say, during the pandemic, it would have released $1 trillion of liquidity for developing countries. These are very important scale-type instruments to provide liquidity at the time that's needed. And in Brazil, uh, just a month ago, the IDB and Brazil uh, launched uh, backing with $5.4 billion a new FX liquidity hub to attract foreign investors into mitigation projects uh, in Latin America. I want to talk a little bit more about that at the end and uh, hand out, uh, uh, extend a hand of partnership and offer to work together with the ADB on a similar hub uh, elsewhere in the world. These were all elements of the Bridgetown Initiative. One of the important and subtle ways in which Bridgetown, I think, made a difference to the agenda on the international financial architecture was by focusing on two things, scale and scope. Let's talk about scope. Our institutional structures were designed in the world, not just the multilateral development banks, were designed to focus attention on the advanced economies with, uh, with incentives and markets uh, and tax systems uh, for them to move further along in the green transition, and special attention to some of the poorest, least developing countries. 
These are both important areas of attention. But the scope has to include everybody. The middle-income countries, many of whom are members of the Asian Development Bank, are the countries which we need to be fully engaged in the energy transition, the green transition. These are countries which represent the biggest increase of future energy demands. And these are countries where some of the poorest, most vulnerable people live. 70% of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. So we need a worldwide effort. And in terms of scale, the, one of the important things that we achieved over the past couple of years was to get a convergence on the scale issue. And that sounds relatively easy. Of course, uh, that is harder, especially because you're dealing with economists. I'm an economist, so I'm happy to say that. And getting economists to agree to one number is not an easy thing to do. But if you look last year, the G20 communique, the COP communique, the Bridgetown Initiative, all settled on the independent high-level expert group number, which is that developing countries need $2.4 trillion per year in climate finance. One number, a convergence on scale. And the importance of that, if we had multiple numbers from multiple places, people would have lost sight of what that is, $2.4 trillion. 12 times total aid budgets in the world. And what that number tells us is that aid cannot do it alone. It tells us that we spend all this time talking about the voluntary carbon market. How much does that raise per year? $2 billion. We need $2.4 trillion. It raises $2 billion. And $1 billion of that two is in India alone. It's not going to get us there. And it's not because it's a lack of integrity. It's because it's voluntary. The voluntary carbon market is an attempt to internalize social externalities. When Arthur Pegu first wrote and developed the idea of social externalities, he didn't say, oh, we could do this voluntarily. No, we need compliance markets if we want the carbon markets to work as effectively. The green bond markets, the yield differential on a green bond versus a non-green bond is not enough to make a difference. Blended finance. Important, but there's not enough blended finance in the world to get you to $2.4 trillion of finance per year. Insurance. Climate change is an uninsurable event. It's the rising risk of loss, but greater certainty, greater correlation, and greater frequency. All the benefits of insurance, of spreading through pools, spreading across time, across assets, they're lost with climate change. So that $2.4 trillion focuses the mind on what we need to do. We need to break, we can get to $2.4 trillion if we break it down. We need to break it down, drill it down. Break down our task into three things. Things that generate revenues. Actually, 70% of this stuff generates revenues. Things that generates no revenues, but savings. Vital stuff, but no revenues, but savings. And things that are pure costs. Things that are pure costs, like loss and damage, there's no alternative but using our precious grants and aid money tilted towards that. And there isn't all, all the grants in the world would not cover loss and damage. Loss and damage is $150 billion a year. So spending grant money on things other than loss and damage is a dangerous thing to do. Because there isn't enough grant money for the things that can't be funded in any other way. If developing countries had to use borrowing money to finance every time there was a disaster, of loss and damage and to rebuild every community, they'd be sinking under oceans of debt long before sea levels rise up. Savings. So if you invest in resilience, you will get savings that are six or seven times more. 
Therefore, countries can borrow for resilience if the borrowing payment to repayment is sufficiently long that they can capture those repayments and the interest rates are sufficiently low that they can escape from a debt trap. And so the multilateral development banks need to be three times bigger they need to activate their callable capital. They need new capital. And three times bigger, they need to engage and emphasize adaptation. That's something we've achieved over the past couple of years. There is now a greater emphasis on adaptation. And the reason why the multilateral development banks need to do it, and Jim Skier said so, the private sector finds adaptation hard to do because there are no revenue streams. Or there are very few revenue streams. Outside of agriculture, there are few revenue streams. Much of this are global public goods. They are public infrastructure goods. How do you decide, how do you get a revenue stream from a seawall that benefits everyone who uh, on the other side of it? Sadly, economics is, a, is part of the problem here because we teach our students to imagine a world in which there's a market for every possible scenario and that we could take a savings from that future and bring it today. That can't be done in rich countries. It definitely can't be done in poor countries. And so we need multilateral development banks to step up to the plate on adaptation finance. And my final words will be about the last big bucket, that, that stuff that generates revenues. Solar, solar farms, wind turbines, hydroelectric power, geothermal, the green transition. We need it. It generates revenues. 80% of green transformation that is taking place in the developed world is being financed by the private sector. That private money is not coming to developing countries. And why is it not coming? Of course, not coming to a very large extent. Why is that happening? Most of the people involved in this are project finances. You tell them the problem is risks, and you think, how can I reduce the risk of my project? How can I reduce the risk of my sector? Actually, the big risks, they're country risks. They're macro risks. We have the data that allows us to break it down. We've got the, the cost of capital data for countries, for sectors, and for projects. And what that tells you is the cost of capital for projects in developing countries are actually not substantially greater than the cost of capital for projects in developed countries if you exclude the macro risk if you exclude the macro risk. That means the scope for us to reduce the cost of capital just by dealing with project risks is not big enough. What is the main driver of macro risk? It is currency risk. And how do we deal with currency risk? And this is something where the IDB would like to partner with the ADB. We have launched a platform. My last minute, let me talk to you about this. We've launched a platform called the EcoInvest platform in Brazil. We backed it with $5.4 billion. It's for EcoInvest projects. And what we're doing is taking the foreign exchange risk over 20 years and turning it into a liquidity risk. We take the nominal decline of the exchange rate and we turn it into a real exchange rate problem by making sure that the project is able to raise prices with inflation. Real exchange rates fall a lot less than nominal exchange rates. And then we only work with partner countries that have stable macro frameworks. And now the real exchange rate isn't even declining, it's stable, but there are wide cycles around the exchange rate. And that is where we, a AAA rated lender, a counter cyclical lender comes in, where you could come in as well, uh, and we lend to projects to deal with those extreme declines where they need a counter cyclical lender who can lend cheaply, not a subsidy, not a not blended finance, uh, not a bailout, lending at our market rate plus the, the, plus the traditional spread for those extreme times. So that is the system we need to deal with. We need new taxes and new grants for loss and damage. We need bigger, bolder, better MDBs, three times bigger, with a focus on adaptation. And we need hubs to deal with liquidity risk and currency risk to bring in the private sector into developing countries. Please join us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Avanish, for your inspiring words. We now move on to the second part of our session, which is a panel discussion. We have a very distinguished lineup of panelists, but in the interest of time, I won't read out all of the bios, but I encourage you to visit our website where they're all listed. Firstly, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Noelle O'Brien, who's the Director for Climate Change at ADB. Along with Noelle, we have Sri Milani Indrawati, 
who's the governor for Indonesia for ADB and the minister of finance for Indonesia. Sri Mulani, if you'd like to join us on stage. Thank you. We also have Mark Brown, governor for the Cook Islands for ADB and prime minister of the Cook Islands. We have Mr. Samir Sherivov, Governor for Azerbaijan for ADB and the Minister of Finance for Azerbaijan. We have Jochen Hugo, who's the Managing Director, Global Head of Sovereign Solutions, Public Sector Group Banking, Capital Markets and Advisory Division at Citi. And we have Fatima Yasmin, who's our own Vice President for Sectors and Themes at the ADB. Thank you, Noel. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, Avanish, please come and join us on the stage. My apologies. Th thank you, Kate. And uh, welcome and thank you to all our panelists for, for joining us today. Um, uh, I'm going to begin uh, by, by asking uh, ADB's uh, Vice President Fatima Yassim uh, to share with us a little bit more detail on some of the work that ADB has been doing uh, to expand its climate agenda and particularly within the context of the Climate Change Action Plan. Over to you, uh, VP. Thank you, Noel. Uh, um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, to start with, uh, we are uh, closely following the uh, Bridgetown Initiative and the discussion on MDB reforms. As you know, the initiative calls for six actions, uh, liquidity support, debt sustainability, SDG stimulus, private investment mobilization, equitable govern uh, governance of financial institutions, and green and just transformation uh, through trade. ADB has undertaken a comprehensive reform roadmap featuring new uh, operating model for faster and more proactive delivery of support to our developing member countries. Our new operating model, which we started implementing in 2023, highlights climate change and private sector developments as two of its key shifts for ADB to be more efficient and more responsive to its clients. To operationalize the climate change shift, at COP28, we launched ADB's Climate Change Action Plan 2023 to 2030. That charts a path for us to deliver accelerated regional climate action and to help our DMCs attain enhanced climate outcomes. Let me share with you few examples of our actions that has been identified in ADB's Climate Change Action Plan. We directly support the task of Breach Down Initiative. In supporting countries on debt restructuring, ADB is increasing availability of finance to support countries pursue climate actions. Last year, we updated our climate advocacy framework, unlocking 100 billion in new funding over next decade. We are now developing a climate utilization plan on how to reach our new sustainable level of lending through high quality supports, addressing the needs of our developing member countries, including their need to pursue climate actions. We have also established an innovative finance facility for climate in Asia and the Pacific, IFCAP, which is mobilizing climate finance at scale through contingent guarantee and grant uh, mechanism. 
Secondly, ADB continues to explore better lending terms and grants for climate resilience. In 2023, the ADB board approved more concessional lending terms and conditions for small island developing states, partly to incentivize countries to invest in climate adaptation and resilience. Under the Asian Development Fund, uh, ADF 14, there is a thematic pool for, uh, to provide additional grant resources uh, uh, beyond country allocation to ADF eligible countries to pursue investments in climate adaptation. In this regard, we thank the generous contribution of our donors for their pledges in ADF 14. On mobilizing private sector investment, ADB is building strong synergies between sovereign and non-sovereign operations which include exploring ways to expand co-financing operation to mobilize private sector capital, increasing the use of transaction advisory services and uh, public-private partnership, mobilizing resources for blended finance operations and supporting blended, blending facilities for climate-focused uh, investments. Under the energy transition mechanism, concessional and commercial capital are utilized from various public and private sources to incentivize the early retirement or repurposing of coal-fired power plants and other carbon-intensive power generation. We are also supporting new investments in clean energy, grid modernization, and energy shortage. Energy storage, I'm sorry. We are also exploring work with key private sector partners on decarbonization, expanding supports to nature innovative technologies and creating innovative platform for mobilizing private sectors. On international trade system, supporting global green and just transition, uh, transition, ADB is promoting regional and global trade and investment towards climate solution. In March, we have uh, um, a uh, stakeholder discussions uh, along with World Trade Organization to understand the interface between trade policy and climate action. Assess the progress on use of trade and trade policy tools for climate actions and identify gaps and challenges as well as actions to facilitate implementation of trade, trade policy measures for climate. Um, so you can see the ADB's efforts and actions both um, enhance in scope and scale conforming to the uh, Bridge Town initiatives as a global multilateral development bank. Thank you very much, uh, VP Fatima, for setting out the, that, the, all of those actions that ADB is taking. Um, Governor Sri Maliani, if, if I can come across to you and, and ask you uh, your views on how finance ministries and, and financial regulators uh, can strengthen fiscal and financial systems for this scale up um, and to align the financial flows with the kind of uh, re resilient and low emissions development that's being called for. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me for this seminar. First, I think the role of finance is very critical to achieve the climate change goal as mentioned uh, by the previous uh, speaker and also the, the two uh, opening. And the role of finance ministers uh, is very important. First, on the program and policy, you have to be able to make sure that your program and policy will fit with the ability to attract more capital, as mentioned, because public finance alone cannot achieve this climate change agenda. And that's why when we talk about program and policy, that includes also deepening your financial market. We, in this case, in Indonesia, we starting with our own budget, meaning that we be more transparent and accountable, providing budget tagging for how much actually within our budget allocated for the climates. 
After that, we also creating special mission vehicle within the Ministry of Finance in order for us to be able to implement a lot of the discussion, guarantee, uh, financing, project development fund, because you cannot immediately attract private sector without they actually know how the government operate and how they are going to finance. So it's a more concrete bridging, just like the theme of this annual meeting, bridging between public and private by continue inventing the instrument. So in this case, Minister of Finance have the special mission vehicle to provide uh, the financing, project development fund, guarantee, resharing, and even in this case, we are inviting and providing what you call it special uh, vehicle in uh, attracting equity financing. So with that, we were able to establish, for example, blended finance, uh, whether this is the theme on a SDG or green, in which we blend the financing from the pure public with the MDBs in this case, including ADBs, and also private sector and philanthropy. So that then can be executed. The third one is actually providing the policy platform that allowing all partners to be able in the same page because it's very important to have that one. So in this case, Indonesia has the energy transition mechanism country platform. I really don't have to explain that the climate change will cost 280 billion, blah, 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 for Indonesia. So it's more and technical on the policy and what is the mechanism. So for the energy transition mechanism, which will cost Indonesia more than 260 billion, we provide this platform in order for us to be able to discuss. And this is with uh, quite a lot of support from the ADB as well as the other bilateral and then private sector engagement. With that platform, we were able to then showcase what does it mean, what does it take, how much it will cost to retire coal. Because we said that, oh, you need to retire coal and you need to have a more renewable. So we come up with not only plan, but then providing a real showcase. And that will provide an idea for public sector, including MDB bilateral, as well as private sector, how we are going to finance this kind of situation and how this blending can be actually developed. I think these are all the concrete action in which finance ministry is going to be playing a very important role. If you have no idea, you don't have capacity as well as willingness and providing leadership and signal, it's going to be hard to attract the real money. The last one in on financial regulator, we need to also come up with two mechanisms in place. Taxonomy, which is very important. It is impossible for the private sector to participate if they don't have any idea what is exactly a regulatory framework on this green financing. And the second one is carbon market. And this is very hard. Drafting regulation may be the most, the easiest way, but make it them work is going to be require a lot of credibility as well as trust, confidence, uh, bridging. And that's exactly what we really need to do. So Indonesia is uh, working with the ASEAN to do the uh, taxonomy, ASEAN taxonomy for the green financing. And we revise it even now three times in order for us to be able to include many of the transition uh, and green financing. And carbon market, this is polluter pay principle. It's theoretically easy when you implement a lot of social, political, and interest group that can be very resistant to that and have an implication on your economy. So this has something to do with subsidy, has something to do about cap and trade, and then you also talk about carbon price, which is not uniform yet across country, across region. So these are all homework which is beyond one country, but I think the building block is very important for finance minister and regulator in order for us to be able to build the right building block for climate change finance. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Governor, for, for that a really uh, excellent explanation of all. And I know you've been very involved in, with the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action with this work also. 
So um, I'm going to move on to Excellency Mark Brown from, from the Cook Islands, one of those countries in the Pacific that's very much at the forefront of the climate crisis and, and the urgency. So maybe um, if in, in your, uh, your views, uh, maybe what are the critical actions that you think MDBs can take to support the SIDS in that scale up of adaptation, uh, particularly in a programmatic manner and in building national responses to loss and damage. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's important to point out the scale uh, when we talk about, uh, and I'm talking here on behalf of the Pacific as the current chair of the Pacific Islands Forum. Um, the forum members of the Pacific are custodians of an area that covers 20% of the world's surface. Yet the investment in adaptation and resilience into this part of the world is a fraction of the adaptation funds that are dispersed. The IMF tells us that for the Pacific, we need $1 billion a year for resilience building for the next 10 years. Now, I put that into perspective with uh, uh, Avanash mentioning $2.4 trillion so it makes our one billion sound like a very modest amount, and in fact, just listening to the minister here for Indonesia, alone the cost for them in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So maybe just give us the one billion and we'll get on with our resilience building, and you guys deal with the hundreds of billions. That, that'll take 15 countries' headaches off your, uh, off your books. Uh, but in our area, of course, uh, we have the diseconomies of scale, which are uh, an added challenge, the disproportionately high cost of infrastructure resilience building uh, that adds to the challenges. So one of the solutions that we in the Pacific uh, really push for is tailored financial solutions. Uh, tailored to our needs, uh, one of the solutions that the Pacific has stood up in last year's uh, leaders meeting uh, is the Pacific Resilience Facility. This is a particular facility that was born out of the frustrations of Pacific countries accessing climate finance, in particular for relatively modest resilience building projects, uh, but scattered amongst many different islands. Uh, in my country, I have 15 islands, so for a small population of less than 20,000 people, uh, we still have to maintain 10 runways, 10 ports, uh, facilities for schools, all of these meters uh, above sea level. So the inundation that we continue to see, the slow onset erosion of islands that's occurring, uh, requires levels of resilience that we need to put in place now. I think nothing can be more confronting than the UN resolution passed, uh, uh, proposed by Pacific leaders for the, uh, the maintaining of the maritime boundaries in the event of climate-induced sea level rise in 2021 and just last year. Uh, the, uh, retaining the statehood of Pacific countries in the face of sea level rise. That really paints the picture of the existential threat. The G20 countries represent 80% of carbon emissions. We uh, have done our part in trying to mitigate and reduce emissions, but our role really is to build resilience. Building resilience for us buys us time. It, by adding a seawall, by strengthening foreshore protection, by sealing a runway, we give it a life of another 10, 20, or 30 years, while the rest of the world moves to try and reduce carbon to get to net zero. We have to build our resilience to protect ourselves against these impacts. So we see it as imperative that those who are the large emitters, that is the board members of MDBs, who are the biggest contributors to the bank, you have an obligation to ensure uh, that the needs the infrastructure resilience needs of our Pacific Island countries are met. Uh, this is from, uh, as I said, 20% of, uh, of the globe that we're responsible for, but 0.03% of carbon emissions globally. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Brown, um, for setting out those, those really urgent needs that you have and, and uh, the fact that you haven't contributed to the to the challenge, um, I'm going. That's going to take me to Governor Sharifov, who is uh, 
from the finance ministry in Azerbaijan and which is the host for the COP29. Now, we've heard the urgent items that are on the table today. Uh, we know that COP29 uh, recognized the need for the transition away from fossil fuels, uh, the agreement on tripling renewables, energy efficiency, and the progress made on the global goal on adaptation and finance. But we know that there's still a lot of progress that needs to be made at COP29 uh, if we're to facilitate this transformational change. And so we'd like to hear from you today, what are the emerging priori priorities for Azerbaijan for COP29? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to state that the urgency of action on behalf of international community and uh, the problems of the looming uh, climate crisis are absolutely obvious. Our keynote speakers very eloquently uh, uh, provided their deliberations on that. So we have almost reached 1.5 degrees uh, ceiling, which was established back in 2015 uh, by the Paris Agreement. And uh, so since uh, this remarkable uh, event, when uh, almost all countries of the world joined this agreement, so there are numerous discussions on moving forward this climate agenda. Much has been done, but uh, I also join the um, statements that much more should be, we need to do. And uh, one of the critical items, of course, is finance. So without proper finance, uh, we will not be able to move this climate agenda forward. There are <coughs> various uh, let's say, options to address this issue. Uh, Azerbaijan, which is hosting COP29 in November, later this year, uh, will be uh, building on positive achievements uh, of uh, Dubai COP28 and uh, will be creating, uh, we hope to create, uh, to build international con uh, consensus uh, to move forward the climate agenda to make uh, both Baku uh, COP29 and the forthcoming uh, COP30 in uh, Belém uh, a success. Of course, there are uh, issues to address. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to come up with a new uh, collective quantified goal. So, because the one which, uh, so the a goal which was established uh, again through uh, uh, very substantial efforts in Paris. Uh, so is uh, the goal which in our viewpoint should be revisited and this is what Azerbaijan is trying uh, to negotiate with all stakeholders, uh, both from the developing uh, countries as well as mostly with the developed, uh, let's say, countries. So, uh, what are, uh, in our viewpoint, uh, some uh, issues which we would like also to specifically uh, highlight? Uh, the issue of energy transition. I think it is symbolic that Azerbaijan, which is the country that uh, um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, together with a number of uh, international oil and gas companies, signed a multi-billion investment contract to unlock energy potential of offshore Azerbaijan uh, to develop oil and gas fields and to deliver this oil and gas to international markets by building an international network of uh, pipelines. Today, uh, Azerbaijan is working, is hosting COP29, and we, are do, uh, we have our own agenda for energy transition, so which is uh, by 2030, to produce 30% uh, of our energy consumption uh, from uh, renewables, excluding hydropower energy. So to do this, uh, to achieve this, we have entered into a number of investment contracts with mm, uh, private uh, companies, uh, international investors, so it means we are attracting FDI for this purpose. But uh, as it, is, it was said today, so uh, we cannot uh, 
uh, attract private sector, we cannot mobilize private sector finance to this end if there is no support on, on the side of the governments, if there is no enabling investment uh, uh, um, environment, so if there are no guarantees or other instruments that could make this investment uh, feasible and, and that could make these projects investable. So therefore our government issued a number of guarantees to, for international investors and we believe this is the only way to move forward at the initial stage uh, so in order to create uh, so the attractiveness of this sector. Uh, I think we were right because we have received more applications for investments in this sector and this is one way to move forward. So therefore, I do believe the energy transition in the uh, countries, uh, fossil uh, fuel, let's say, producers like Azerbaijan is an important uh, uh, direction, but uh, it should be uh, handled very smoothly in our way. Uh, view, uh, way. There are, they should not be uh, very, um, how uh, should I put it, uh, puni pun uh, punishing measures against these countries in the way of various restrictions, tariffs, or whatever. I think the process uh, should go um, in a very uh, gradual and smooth way because the climate agenda forces these countries to do it. So there is no need to, uh, let's say, create additional uh, let me put it this way, encouragement, uh, let's say, mechanism to enforce uh, these actions on the side of these countries. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, in principle, we, I would like to uh, maybe to stress one other point. Um, uh, a distinguished professor in his eloquent speech, so he uh, indicated so that there is finance, uh, but we need, we need to raise this finance. There is finance with multilateral development banks. I believe they are extremely important uh, uh, enablers uh, for the climate finance. But uh, what we can see uh, is that the uh, simple reallocation of funding within these multilateral development banks uh, for climate-related projects, which is, again, much welcome and appreciated, and we should prioritize that, is not sufficient. So we need to raise money and uh, the, the uh, sort of, I think, only one source of uh, money is not sufficient. So there were a number of proposals. There are many more proposals that are aired and we have to uh, uh, probably choose a number of proposals. There should be, again, incentives, carbon markets. Uh, we could uh, look at potential taxation of uh, let's say, in, in various ways, uh, so in order to raise this money. So this is the most important issue once we, and in order to, to be able to do so, of course there is a need for mechanisms. So we have to uh, deal with the fact that most of uh, carbon emissions uh, fall on not so many countries of the world. So therefore this is something we have to address. If we look at the number of companies who are, uh, let me put it this way, champions of emissions, uh, their number is not that big. So if we concentrate on these uh, specifics, we find the ways of attracting them to uh, uh, perform our uh, climate agenda, I think this is the way forward. How to do it? Uh, of, uh, of course, most of the money, I do believe, should come from the developed world. Uh, so how to mobilize these resources? This is uh, an important topic. But uh, I could recall that uh, in the aftermath of the global uh, financial crisis of 2008, so the world has demonstrated a very quick uh, action when uh, G20 established a number of mechanisms to address this issue. Uh, I believe it is the case now as well. It can be done in this manner, uh, in particular. Uh, so one of the ways forward was to uh, find the ways to uh, prevent uh, avoidance of taxation in many countries, and, and OECD was extremely instrumental in that. Uh, 
I would like to recognize uh, esteemed Sri Mulyani Gravati, who is co-chair of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, and thank you for inviting Azerbaijan to join the coalition, which we do as observers at this stage. But we very much uh, uh, believe that finance ministers has a special role to move the climate agenda forward. Uh, so to conclude, uh, what I would like to say, I believe so uh, our planet is our common responsibility. So therefore, I think it is uh, time uh, to act, and I, I believe that we must probably act now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor, and uh, we uh, very much appreciate the efforts that Azerbaijan is taking in the lead up to COP and look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Um, Avinash, I'm going to ask you maybe brief, briefly to touch a little bit more on uh, your idea on what the public sector and MDBs can do with uh, creatively de-risking and incentivizing those private sector investments that we've heard about, and, and in particular, the role that regulatory intervention can play. Thanks, Noel. I, I think th I'd begin by saying that I'm not sure that role that the MDBs play, and this is something uh, that uh, the distinguished speaker from Azerbaijan mentioned, is necessarily a capital-intensive role. Um, I think that the MDBs need to be marshalling their capital for things that the private sector finds harder to do, like adaptation. Uh, and so they, they can lend long-term, low-cost. Uh, they, they are uh, much more able to do that. And I think that's where they, their capital should be focused. But I think there's an important role to be played in creating the environment that will reassure overseas investors to invest in mitigation in developing countries. Many people say, well, why do we need to worry about that? Why don't we just have domestic mobilization? And I think the key thing is we are asking a group of developing countries, a majority of whom are probably in this region, to have an investment in the green transition of a scale and pace never before ever done. And so I know for certain, there are a few things I know for certain, but one I know for certain is that the investment required is more than savings. And if investment exceeds savings, you need foreign investment. So how do we get the foreign investment? We need to break down what is the cost of capital in different areas. And we have project risk issues, contracts, um, uh, the nature of the governance of the project. We have sector risk issues, uh, regulation, and we have macro risk issues. There's a tremendous amount of work already being done on de-risking projects, on de-risking sectors, improving regulation. I believe in focusing on, on where there's a neglect, where there's a vacuum, and the vacuum is on managing the macro risk. So I'm not saying we should stop doing all the great work on reducing project risk and sector risks. We need to redouble those efforts. But there's already work being done. There's already great experts doing great things in that area. Um, if you're setting up a, a, a regulatory regime for solar power, you can pick it off the shelf these days. Uh, Irina and others will help you on what is the right power purchase agreements, what is the right pricing, the right sector arrangements. So there's a lot of work being done on there where there isn't work being done is how do we reduce what is three quarters of the cost of capital in developing countries three quarters of the cost of capital is managing country risk macro risk uh, and that's where we need to do more work um, and I think the majority of that uh, is is about the fact of who is currently managing that risk we're asking international banks who have do not have limitless capital and limitless liquidity to offer 20-year guarantees on emerging market risk, which is highly pro-cyclical with all their other risks. No wonder they charge a risk premium. And the history is that that risk premium is about twice the actual risk. 
Now, I don't believe that means that that's a risk premium that they can reduce because that's a risk premium that's a buffer for actual risks of uncertainty and risk of volatility. The only way we can reduce that is by not having that risk to manage. And that's where the MDBs can play an important role of unpacking the risk and reducing what needs to be managed. If we don't need to manage inflation risk, that removes a third of the problem. If we don't need to manage um, uh, exchange rate instability caused by macro instability, that removes a third of the problem. Uh, and so I think that we, the MDBs, need to play a role, a partnership role with governments to make sure we can reduce the inflation risk, reduce the macro instability risk, and let the projects work with their banks to, to manage what is left with the MDBs coming in as a counter cyclical lender in extreme situations. Thank you, Avinash. And I'm going to go immediately to Wacom, who's here from Citigroup, and um, ask you from the private sector perspective. You've heard from a uh, government perspective, and, and you've heard from Avinash in relation to MDBs. And so from, from your perspective, uh, do you agree with what you're hearing, or, or uh, have you other or additional views on, on what needs to be done? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Noel. Um, I, I think there's, in, in, in the conversation, there's one huge element that for now I think it's missing, and it's project preparation. Okay, we, we, um, <clears throat> we're trying to solve for, um, you know, investment grade issues where, like, the money, this, you know, $150 trillion of G funds money that theoretically is long-term pension money and, and, uh, and uh, in, in the developed world should theoretically flow to EM, and it doesn't because there's an, there's an investment-grade conundrum. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a commercial bank in the US like we are, there are limits into, uh, in terms of how much of your portfolio can go to high yield. Uh, there are very small limits. Uh, same thing with if you're a pension fund or, 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 or you're managing fiduciary money. So we continue to solve for that, right? And, and, but let me park that for a second because that, we also talk a lot about how do we rotate the, the portfolio of the development banks, right? And as, as, as you rightly pointed out, the development banks have enough capital for now. They need to be three times the size, but that's assuming that we identify and have a pipeline of projects. And that pipeline of projects is missing. And it's, it's, it's missing in the mitigation area and in adaptation, you know, 10 times worse, as, 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 you know, because those are the numbers that end up going to, to the two things in that proportion. So the, the point is, it, 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 the, the, whole, the whole issue about effects, right? How do we, um, you know, go to investment great countries? How do you go to an Indonesia or a Brazil or, a, or, a, or an India and, and try to get that pricing lower so there's more projects? I think that's huge because those are investment great countries, biggest emitters, right? But when you, when, when you start going to the lower, you know, the double B and below, we don't have that many great solutions. And we, we, we know the formula, right? And, and the formula basically says you have to create a capital stack where you have the project sponsors and then you have some mezzanine absorber so that then you can do investment grade and go to the conund solve the conundrum of the, of, the, of the institutional investors and the commercial banks. With the commercial banks... Um, are, are really kind of like intermediaries in trying to put this together. Because when you look at the size of our balance sheets, all of the large banks, we are the same size we were before the financial crisis. And the economies in nominal terms, in, in dollars and euros, are two and a half times. So we're, we're smaller and smaller as we go, but the money that is actually managed off balance sheet is bigger. So how do we get to that? But, but the point is, I, I think we have good ideas on FX, we have good ideas on how we rotate portfolios, we have good ideas on how do we create a capital stack that, that uh, gets a lit, uh, at least a good portion of it investment grade in a sub-investment grade uh, country, but we have a problem with projects. We, we wrote a report by, for, for COP2028 20, 20, on you know, the whole thing about you, what are the risks and how you create a project etc. And 
when doing that, there's, we, we found out that there's 1,200 platforms internationally to help you develop projects. So if you're a country that's not institutionally strong, right, which is why you're single B to start with, and all of a sudden you want to figure out where do I go, right? You go to your regional development bank, for, for sure. You start there. But the regional development bank can help you. And, 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 and to your point, Avinash, I think it's right that it's less balance sheet than institutional capacity in helping you figure, figure out the formula. But the, and, and I see this in many of the regional development banks. They have a view of certain of these platforms, but not all of them. So it's very difficult to navigate who are these 12, 1,200 uh, people. We, we have seen efforts that are really interesting, like Allied Climate Partners, for example. These guys are trying to put together facilities where project preparation becomes a business in itself. So you, you, you take money, and they're trying to, yeah, I mean, this is no commercial for them, it's just anecdotal. Uh, they, 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 that they, um, you know, they're putting together $100, $150 million per region and say this is for project preparation. And the complexities of you know, engineering permits, social, et cetera, w once that matures, somebody else can come and execute the project and they exit. So these kinds of solutions we need, right? And, and, and I'll, I'll just a couple more words on, 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 on adaptation, right? On adaptation, I, I, I'm currently involved in two conversations where what is commercial, right? What's the portion that's commercial? There's so much that needs to be done there. You know, we're, we're like in, in large country with a, with a lot of forest. You know, they know where the issues are, how much they need. But when you, and they and they tell they tell me right, they tell city, help us figure out a a, a, a a platform where investors come, commercial bankers come and lend. Okay, how much is it commercial? You know, the whole thing what you're going to create a sustainable agriculture has a payback, and there's no answer. And I know, you know, I know USAID is trying to figure this out in a couple of countries in Latin America, and then hopefully that gets replicated. Or, you know, you, you could, could, could I do seawalls and basically tax the tourism, uh, the, the incoming tourism if it's high end, and securitize that, and then that becomes commercial and the private sector can play. So. That, but that goes back to, to, to project preparation because that is understanding where the cash flows come from and how, and how you put the whole formula together. So I, I would, you know, having agreed with a ton or everything that we have said, I think we have to go back to this project issue because that's the, the you know, the, the genesis of everything and we're doing a, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say a bad job, but suboptimal, right? There's a lot being done but a lot more needs to, to happen. No, thank you very much, Joaquim. And I think uh, for in ADP, I think we even see it, maybe it's a little step even earlier where within the nationally determined contributions, within the national adaptation plans, uh, those need to be converted e into investment pipelines and, and, then, and then into uh, projects uh, that are ready for investment. I, I'm going to come back around to, to VP Yasmin. Um, in the context of... Uh, the, the, the scaling up of uh, climate action. Uh, ADP is playing a significant role in supporting uh, climate country platforms, uh, such as the recent development in, in Bangladesh with the Climate Development Partnership, uh, your home country. Uh, would, uh, we'd like you to share uh, your views on how such platforms uh, can not only help countries, but also help MDBs in delivering the climate outcomes. Thank you, Noel. Let me start with how it started. At COP28, COP28, the MDBs in their joint statement identified the need for working with developing countries in establishing country climate platforms in order to have in-country coordination an impact on climate actions. Um, as a government-led mechanism, the country uh, climate platforms are expected to advance strategic dialogue, support technical and financial resource mobilization, and improve operations coordination. 
Um, very recently, ADB uh, uh, is involved in supporting many of the DMC established as such platform, as example Bangla uh, in Bangladesh, where ADB coordinating with other development member, uh, with development partners on the establishment of Bangladesh Climate Development uh, uh, Partnership, which was launched by the Bangladesh Prime Minister on 22nd of April. BCDP aims to support scaling up of low carbon and climate resilient investments essential for achieving uh, Bangladesh Vision, Vision 2041. Uh, the Vision 2041 uh, uh, envisage a carbon neutral and cl climate sustainable developed develop economy for the country. Um, the another example, ADP and the World Bank are collaborating under Nepal's Green, Resilient and Inclusive Development which is known as GREED, to address complex challenges related to economic development, climate change, and uh, others. Uh, GREED become a, a, uh, you know, approved by the government of Nepal, uh, um, and the initial uh, uh, commitments uh, were, were um, identified. It's for 7.4 billion. Uh, for uh, ongoing and the future support. Policy reforms for climate actions are being supported as part of GREED development policy credit uh, series using the policy-based loan by both ADB and the World Bank. And uh, uh, in another such, such example, we have uh, listening to it uh, that uh, um, uh, ADB is the core partner to the Indonesian's energy transition mechanism country platform under the leadership of uh, the finance minister, Sri Mulyani. And we are supporting discussions with the broad range of international partners under the platform. So these are uh, some of the examples where ADB is uh, actively involved and to bring uh, synergy and mobilizing resources under, under the country initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, VP, for those examples that ADB is working on. And I'm going to return to Governor Sri Malyani and ask her, uh, one, to share a little bit more on what e Indonesia is doing on, on, on the just energy transition work, but also to respond to what, or react to what she's hearing um, from other panelists here at the moment. Over Thank you, you. Nico and Noah. I think interesting Joachim mentioned about the project development, especially how you are going to prepare a project that can attract private sector. And private sector will only attract it if the project generates revenue. And that is exactly maybe the, the most uh, important, how you are going to be able to repay back for if you are going to borrow and what rate of return. Many countries, including Indonesia, has project development fund. Uh, we can develop project, as uh, Minister uh, Samir mentioned earlier, but how you are going to prepare project that really match the appetite of the private sector, I think that's important. Then linked to what Avinash mentioned earlier, the private sector will see on extrinsic FX rates as well as macro risk as the biggest risk that then making the rate of return becoming very low or they are going to need to have a higher rate of return in order for us, for them to be able to participate. My thinking is that if it is FX rate, uh, you can do the hedging. The macro rates is really related to the quality of their fiscal monetary policy. And for a small island, maybe it's going to be very difficult because when you have a hurricane, then the whole macro stability is going to be also affected. It is not only about whether you have a good, sound fiscal policy and monetary, but the repeated shock coming from a natural disaster can uh, jeopardize. So these are all a very fundamental few which cannot be solved with the current instrument. 
that is the stream instrument, whether this is lending or even in this case equity or the guarantee, which everybody now have the hope of how you are going to skim this guarantee. So my comment in this case is I think work very hard regarding who's, what is the real fundamental and what kind of instrument and policy that need to match with this, the structuring issue, which is already laid out by all the party private sector, and then uh, small island, or this is single B or trip second B, which is maybe not a, uh, an investment grid. On the country platform, uh, Bangladesh mentioned that uh, you just following the Indonesia, and Indonesia is among the first that we actually announced this country platform. When we also presiding the G20, and by the way, Indonesia 11th rank on the polluter, but 24th rank on the CO2 per capita. So that, that's just a response to what Joaquin mentioned about the G20 uh, as the responsible uh, country to emit CO2. On the energy transition mission, when Indonesia hold this presidency of G20, we also, in this case, one of the session on finance in on sustainable finance. And the sustainable finance related to especially the most ex expensive transition is energy transition. And that's why we're discussing with many partners uh, how a country like Indonesia, who has also many natural resource uh, uh, rich, whether this is on the, in the form of coal, we have gas, oil, we also have the renewable like geothermal, hydro, and then uh, the solar, and even wind. So the question is how you are going to rebalance the composition of the energy. Currently, we have 60% more of our energy mix is coal. So for Indonesia, is the question, could you reduce the coal? But we have a lot of coal. We even export coal in this case. And coal is very important on the revenue of the government. So this is going to be like the situation that needs to be discussed. But in order for us to be able to then making a progress on the discussion, we voluntarily say, say, okay, if we are going to retire, let's say, 5 gigawatt of our 65 giga coal, let's start with one project. That is one IPP, which then... ADB and us, Minister of Energy, we are all discussing about how we are going to retire this 660 megawatt. These are all the building blocks that we put in the energy transition mechanism. Because everybody now talking about this project. Retiring this coal, let's talk about 660 megawatt retiring this coal. Then we talk, who's the owner of this uh, coal producer, uh, coal power plant? It's a private sector. They've already borrowed with the expectation that this coal will operate for 30 years. Now we are going to reduce into 24 years. So they are going to like burn the money. I cannot repay the bank if you cut short my project. So who's going to compensate this private sector? So we discuss with the ADB and all the private sector and those who ask us to retire coal. Who's going to pay for this? Me? No. -uh. Because I've already have quite a lot of spending, which is important for human capital, road, and other. I'm not going to shut down the coal, and then I have to pay them. And then, so who's going to pay this? This is exactly putting the real problem on a table, and then say, when the bill coming, who's going to pay? And you cannot just say that it is Ministry of Finance who should pay that one. The good side about this, by doing that, we now working with the ADB and private sector and philanthropies. Okay, let's talk about this. If we are going to retard, what is the net present value of this seven year that is going to be cut short? How much it costs? And who's going to voluntarily pay in this case? So we try to even mobilize and arranging this exactly what you mentioned about project development preparation by this project of retiring coal. And you can see that it is very complex. The ADB is really putting quite a lot on this, but also a lot of private sector working together with us and then with philanthropy. This is exactly what the blended finance. So the ETM, your uh, country platform, should be able to not only talking about headline. Headline will be nice. We have JetP, 21 billion money over there, half of this private, half of the public. but. We really make sure that this number will work. Really, 
going down into the real project. And it will be seen and tested about the just principle. When you saw, when, when we talk about equitable or just principle, really? Who's really, how you define this just? Because that is exactly who's going to pay for this kind of effort. Retiring 60, 660 megawatt, which is around 22 megaton, is it megaton of the CO2 reduction for seven years. That is maybe the real test case, and Indonesia have those luxury to do that. I, I know that for the small island like Cook Island, that is a totally different challenge. So I sympathize and have a quite great uh, empathy on the small island situation, which is not really have the luxury like the big country like Indonesia, or in this case, Azerbaijan or Brazil and others. So, need to have special attention. One billion, that solves a lot of problems, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, and, and I think uh, uh, Governor Sri Malayani needs a round of applause because it's our understanding that this is the first instrument of its kind to bring about the early closeout of coal. I mean, we, we, we heard so much about the renewable investment um, and, and so impressive that, I mean, you, you really know the nitty gritty of, of, of this. Um, and Kate, who's, who's our host for the early part, has, has been very closely involved with the, the just transition side. And it is a huge body of work. And that, and that is just one deal. Um, for, the, for this level of preparation. Um, uh, I'm going to go quickly to Prime Minister Brown. Um, so we hear a lot of reforms on the debt mechanisms for SIDS to help adapt to the growing risk of climate change. So how do you see uh, such proposed reforms being taken forward in the Pacific region? Yeah, thank you very much again. <laughs> It's, uh, it's interesting how uh, statistics and uh, diseconomies can uh, change things. Uh, prior to our investment into solar energy, uh, we would have been ranked on a per capita basis as probably having a higher carbon emission than Indonesia. Um, again, just an interesting note how small changes make a big impact for uh, small island uh, countries. Uh, if there's one thing that COVID taught us is that you can change the rules. Uh, to suit the circumstances. Uh, for us, COVID was a, um, a game changer in terms of uh, losing four years of productivity. Uh, that was on the back of losing uh, all of our cash reserves and building up some debt to help us see through uh, that uh, period of the COVID. Uh, and even though we are just now back to GDP levels of uh, 2020, uh, that's four years of lost productivity. What we are now get seeing, though, is that, that debt uh, repayments are now coming home uh, to roost. So from a, a, a pre-COVID level of 5% of government revenues going to debt servicing, that is now tripled, more than tripled. Uh, that is putting a squeeze on fiscal space and including investment into uh, climate adaptation and resilience measures. I think the uh, the uh, Bridgetown initiatives that have been proposed, that are proposed by Prime Minister Motley, are something that we strongly uh, support as well. And I have to commend the, the ADB uh, for the new concessional uh, financing facility that the board approved just last year on extended terms, 40-year terms at 1% with 10-year grace period. This is the sort of uh, new debt mechanisms that certainly go a long way to helping countries like us. And if we're looking at uh, the type of things that we would see as helping us in our debt situation, uh, again, the, the call is, you know, MDBs need to be bigger, need to be bolder, and we need to take um, really bold uh, decisions and actions. And as I said, COVID showed us that we can do that. Printing money, was it uh, quantitative easing? Uh, well, we borrowed some of that, of course. Uh, yes, the, some of that is coming to roost with higher interest rates and the inflationary uh, impacts that it caused, but uh, there is, we can do these things. I would look at and, and talk to our uh, banks about the need to cap uh, loan repayments uh, at a level that is manageable for countries like us to enable the economic growth that we are experiencing to not be hampered uh, by the call for uh, loan repayments now exceeding uh, 15, 16% of, of revenues. I think 
again, another bold measure we need to look at is if you aggregate the total debt of Pacific Island countries, even just with uh, the ADB, uh, a refinancing, a total refinancing of all of that debt would go a long way to reducing uh, the debt distress uh, that many of these countries have. Uh, if we're able to put out new financing mechanisms of 40 years, why not look at refinancing existing debt to provide a level of uh, debt comfort to Pacific Island countries? That uh, level of uh, boldness innovation, I think, is going to be required. And, of course, it can be coupled with uh, the support mechanisms that the bank will offer in terms of improving uh, domestic resource mobilization within our countries. Many of our Pacific countries operate uh, with very small public administrations uh, in certain areas. They operate without the new technology that is available to improve efficiencies uh, on things like tax collection. So investments which are, again, relatively modest in financial platforms that integrate banking systems uh, across some of our countries, uh, investments that need to protect banking systems where correspondent banking is at risk in many of our countries, with banks withdrawing because of the cost of meeting uh, international uh, reporting standards uh, and uh, de-risking, if you like, their product. Uh, these are ways that I uh, believe our, our MDBs, the Asian Development Bank in particular, uh, can help us with um, addressing some of these new debt mechanisms. It's not so much we're looking at a foregoing of debt, uh, but certainly look at the situation when the need arises to modify um, our debt repayments so that we can get back onto our feet. And probably the, the one thing that small economies like ours do have is, is the ability to be nimble uh, and the, the ability to react and, uh, very quickly uh, to any measures, fiscal measures that we may put in place uh, relative to much larger economies where the changes take a lot longer to actually see the impact. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Brown, and, and some uh, very uh, uh, interesting food for thought for ADB in that context. I'm going to come across to Governor Sharifov, and we will be closing shortly. I, in, I know there are six o'clock commitments for, for some of our panelists. So, um, Governor Sharifov, I, I would really ask you to uh, what more you want to share with us in terms of uh, the preparation for COP, uh, your expectations, and um, how, what you expect from MDBs in, in terms of COP29. Thank you very much. Preparations are on the way. <laughs> it's a very big uh, event, uh, so therefore we have established a special committee to organize this event. And uh, there is a group of people who is dealing with negotiations because it's uh, an inclusive process whereby we have to negotiate with a lot of parties, both with the donor communities and with the recipient community, in order to agree upon, uh, as it, I, I said, new co collective quantified goals. So this is with regard to finance. Uh, so it is our uh, ambition and intention to try to bring, to align all the parties involved to reach the agreement on this goal and um, to unlock really so the funding uh, for the climate agenda. Uh, I would uh, like uh, also to mention in this regard uh, that uh, MDBs, like Asian Development Bank, they are important players in this process. Uh, during the spring meetings, uh, so we discussed these issues both with the IMF and the, the World Bank. Uh, I mentioned so the coalition of finance ministers, which uh, unites almost more 93 countries, as far as I remember, and uh, 27 institutions. So they also addressed these issues, and there was a call for action. So I think we believe Azerbaijan very much um, counts uh, so and relies on the support of the coalition in order to achieve the, these shared goals. Um, in principle, uh, we once again believe that uh, sort of most MDBs uh, they 
took this uh, item very high on their agenda. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, leveraging the private sector, uh, let's say, funds will be a very important way forward. And there is money available, I fully agree with our distinguished uh, speaker. There is money available, we need to think about the ways. And I do believe, I mean, there are, again, there will be many examples of for energy transition. Uh, so, and ADB, in my uh, opinion, sh can play a role. It can create a sort of handbook of potential cases of whereby so the countries with, uh, who are fossil fuel producers, they can go ahead. But uh, I would like once again to go back to the issue of adaptation. Uh, so this uh, will not be possible with private sector money. So we have to be absolutely clear about that. It is absolutely critical to, to make it very clearly. Again, the countries with fossil, fossil fuel exporters, I mean, with potential, uh, let's say, uh, middle income or either lower middle income, upper middle income, they can do this transition, they can invite the private sector, irregardless of uh, the constraints that the commercial banks uh, may have uh, in this, um, for these projects. But, uh, so the least developed countries, I think it will be a very big problem for them. So therefore, we have to be absolutely frank, and that is why we need to, uh, uh, to go for this COP29, uh, so we need to continue our discussions with the developed world and to seek additional sources of funding. Once again, I would like to reiterate that simply reallocating funds, again, which are um, uh, earmarked for development finance, at the multilateral development banks uh, is not sufficient. We need to uh, find additional money, but uh, thereafter this money could, once again, could be managed by MDBs and they could ensure that the funds are properly utilized, they are uh, spent on purpose and they uh, uh, will ensure that the climate agenda is, uh, let's say, met. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Sharifov. And uh, I, I'm going to um, say um, we're going to wrap it up here uh, because um, some of our esteemed guests have rushed from one event to be here with us. And uh, I know there is a schedule now for, for a next uh, round, another event. We could go on with this conversation for, for a long time today. Um, there will be many more opportunities and, and certainly with, with COP29 uh, uh, for this year. So um, I would like to ask you to give a big round of applause uh, for our esteemed panelists. Greatly appreciate the time that you've given and on behalf of ADB, uh, very much appreciated. I, I am going to ask the panelists if you will bear with us and take one photograph before you, you, you leave. And, and thanks everyone and have a good evening. <laughs>